Thank you uh, for the invitation to speak to you today and uh, to come to this beautiful place. I'd like to share with you the, our data on behalf of many people uh, of um, abiraterone and uh, CYP17 inhibition in patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer. You've already heard uh, from Bruce the uh, background for uh, targeting uh, this target in these patients. The uh, financial disclosure, this uh, compound was made at the Institute of Cancer Research where I work and has now been licensed to Cougar Biotechnology. I'm going to divide my talk into uh, four main sections. I'll start with the background and the hypotheses with which we started back in uh, 2004. CYP17, as you've heard, is a key enzyme in androgen and estrogen synthesis. It uh, converts pregnenolone to 17-hydroxypregnenolone, and the blockade of this enzyme decreases testosterone and estradiol. And in fact, congenital deficiency of this enzyme does not result in adrenal insufficiency, but due to the ACTH feedback loop, as you'll see in this cartoon, actually results in increased upstream steroids, particularly deoxycorticosterone and corticosterone, due to the ACTH increase, resulting downstream in hypokalemia, hypertension, and fluid overload in these children with, uh, with uh, this recessive condition that can be easily controlled by either uh, mineral corticoid antagonists or steroids. It's important to note that the upstream steroids of the enzyme have been shown to actually bind and activate mutated AR. And this is part of our uh, a priori prospective evaluation in our protocol. So we initially postulated that uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer is frequently uh, remaining um, driven by a ligand-activated androgen receptor. This was based on the work of many people, many of you in the audience, and I thank you that, uh, for all your work. Um, I, I guess our second hypothesis was that upstream ligands of the blockade, particularly C21 steroid levels, could actually, due to this increased ACTH level, activate the promiscuous AR and drive CRPC growth. So we postulated a priori that if we saw patients progressing on this uh, CYP17 blockade, that by actually blocking this ACTH drive through low-dose steroids, we could actually bring down ACTH, bring down the upstream steroids, and actually cause a response. And I'll show you that data in a moment. So we, I'm going to present to you data on two trials. The first one was a phase one, two study. Uh, first patient was treated in December 2005. I don't have uh, time to present all the data, but uh, essentially this was the first in human, first in class, continuous oral dosing with this agent. The phase one studies in capsules, 250 milligrams uh, in size, administered one daily. Uh, the dose escalation was from 250 to 2,000 milligrams with 28 days, i.e. approximately one month, defined as one treatment course. Straight to results, we have treated to date 52 patients, although in fact we only have 44 patients to date that have reached three months of therapy. The remaining patients are still coming up to three months of therapy. So 44 patients are valuable for response. Importantly, in the dose escalation phase one portion, we saw no dose limiting toxicity. The toxicity was as expected, uh, target blockade related and hypokalemia, hypertension, uh, and uh, fluid retention were seen and easily controlled uh, by a plerinone as uh, our colleagues in, in U.S. centers are now seeing in uh, U.S. patients. Based on our endocrine data, we, we uh, selected 1,000 milligrams per day as the recommended dose for further evaluation in phase two studies. In the phase two trial, we treated a further 34 patients to the 18 patients in the phase one study. The baseline disease characteristics of these patients include a median baseline PSA of 75, bone metastasis on bone scan in 31 of 44 patients, and presence of measurable disease by resist in 21 of 44, or almost half the patients. The median number of prior hormonal agents uh, given to these patients was three. And in particular, please note that approximately half the patients had previously received steroids. Uh, in our site, we use dexamethasone 0.5 milligrams per day as our standard steroid manipulation uh, treatment. Anti-tumor activity, 61% or 27 of 44 of these evaluable patients have had a 50% fall in PSA. Half the patients have had a 75% PSA fall with a quarter of the patients having a more than 90% PSA decline. One intriguing patient had a, a PR on CT scan but in the presence of a rising PSA. 
Overall, the median time to progression by PSE working group criteria at present is 252 days. A previous study published in JCO at our site um, in a similar population of patients had a time to progression by the same criteria of 43 days. Importantly, we have not only seen PSA falls, since I was particularly concerned that we might see falling PSAs by the absence of responses, but we have seen in over half the patients confirmed partial responses by resist radiological criteria. A further seven of 21 patients have had stable disease uh, for more than three months. Importantly, we have seen evidence on bone imaging, bone, uh, bone scan, um, also on bone CT scanning and MRI scanning of regressing bone disease and healing bone metastasis. Also improving symptoms of patients stopping analgesia, particularly opiate analgesia, falling alkaline phosphatase and falling LDH levels to normal. As you'd expect with um, inhibition of this enzyme, C1720 lyase and 17 alpha hydroxylase, we saw decreases in testosterone, estradiol, DHEA and androstenedione and essentially all the hormones downstream of CYP17. We saw as expected an increase in ACTH and in, an increase that's ACTH driven of the upstream steroids, the oxycorticosterone and corticosterone. So what we're seeing here is that the blockade of this enzyme results as expected in increased hormone levels upstream. If we add steroids to abiraterone, we will block that ACTH increase and decrease upstream steroids that may also activate AR. And this was an a priori prospective evaluation in all patients failing abiraterone that they continued on abiraterone and dexamethasone. So this is quite an important point to make here. So in this particular patient who had previously failed dexamethasone at 0.5 milligrams per day, started on abiraterone, and you see an initial response and then a progression with the PSA rising to approximately 120. And then abiraterone and dexamethasone were continued together. The patient having failed, both dexamethasone alone, the same dose, and abiraterone alone. And you'll see that this patient's had a more than 99% fall in PSA with the combination of abiraterone and dexamethasone, which has now lasted for almost uh, a year. This is a further patient who had previously again failed on dexamethasone, failed on an HDAC inhibitor of Depsipeptide phase two trial just before starting abiraterone, had an impressive response to abiraterone but was then slowly progressing. Again, the patient received abiraterone and dexamethasone at the same doses and you'll see again a fall in PSA by more than 50%, lasting again approximately six months and continuing at present. We have seen this salvage by adding steroid now in five of 16 patients, suggesting that perhaps in some patients, a promiscuous AR that is activated by upstream steroids may be driving disease um, in abiraterone progressing patients. So in summary, in the first study, we have shown that it is safe to inhibit CYP17 and that we can do that in, in our patients. I should say that at, during progression, we have not seen increasing hormone levels in any of these patients. We have seen significant anti-tumor activity in the pre-chemotherapy space and what we believe is durable responses lasting more than six months in many patients in chemo-naive disease. Our median time to progression in, in this uh, population is currently 252 days. Similar data is now being seen in several sites in the US and has been reported by the San Francisco, the San Francisco group by Chuck Ryan and ASCO this year.